Cool. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by now you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, still being an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessings of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Come to those last verses. Good morning. It's uh, good to see you, everyone here, uh, and those uh, online uh, as well. Uh, how are you going with Hebrews? Good, yeah. Hard, easy. Silence. Um, I find like every section is just packed full of lots of ideas. It might be raising uh, questions for you, uh, and maybe it is hard. Um, to understand everything that is going on. Um, so if that is you, I think feel okay. Um, that's me as well, but maybe that's just me. Um, one of the difficulties with this passage uh, are the verses that speak uh, about falling away. Uh, and that raises a whole lot of questions. Uh, can a Christian uh, fall away? Uh, or if a person does fall away, um, does that mean that they weren't uh, really a Christian uh, in the first place? Uh, the, the book of Hebrews, as we've been seeing, uh, has a number of warnings uh, all uh, the way through it. Uh, it's a letter, it's a written sermon. Uh, there, are, there are five main warnings. And so we've, we've already seen a few uh, in, our, in our first week. Uh, in chapter 2, uh, verse 1, uh, we saw uh, there the, the warning of a 
paying the most careful attention uh, to what we have heard so that you do not drift away. Uh, And then last week uh, in chapter 3, Uh, we had that warning of of not having a a sinful, unbelieving heart uh, that turns away from the living God and so falling short then of receiving uh, God's eternal rest. And this morning uh, we have uh, the third one in uh, chapter 6, those verses there um, from verses 4 to 6. So uh, you can see them on the screen or in your Bible And I love you to have your Bibles open so you can be following on uh, this morning. Uh, This one is perhaps the the strongest uh, of of all of them. Now, why do warnings exist? Warnings exist because there must be some danger. uh, And so the warning is there uh, to protect us. So here you go. There's there's a warning. We're, We're warned so that we don't fall into that which is dangerous. And so these warnings that we have in the book of Hebrews, I think they are, they're real warnings uh, for us, uh, for Christians. Uh, because those who were receiving Hebrews back then, us today, uh, are believers. Uh, they were on the whole like Jewish uh, believers and so the purpose of these warnings, it's a, it's a call to, to keep going, to keep trusting, keep holding fast to Christ as the, the anchor in your life. That is the, the purpose of why these warnings are here. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back uh, to the, the warning uh, in chapter 6. Uh, but I want you to see them in the context of this whole section. Don't get tripped up by just seeing them as three isolated verses understand the warning in the context of what is going on around it as well. Um, I don't know about you, my Bible has a heading um, smack in the middle of what we just read, uh, warning against uh, falling away. Uh, And so yes, there's truth in that. Uh, But I want to suggest that the big question of what um, we've just heard uh, is not can a Christian fall away, uh, but rather is this. What is it to be spiritually mature. And so that is what we're going to be thinking about this morning. And I would say, if you are spiritually mature, and then then you will not be in that same danger of falling away, because you're going to be strong in Christ. Uh, So I'm going to share seven things with you uh, from this passage. And I'm not expecting you to uh, remember all, all seven. But there are seven things here which talk about what it is to be spiritually mature. There's not a complete list. Um, If I was writing a list, I'd come up with probably a different seven. But this is what we have uh, in this uh, passage. I've flipped it as well. It's really speaking about more about immaturity. I've made it into the positive, uh, looking at what it means to be mature. And so before we get into it, maybe just ask yourself, um, would you say you are mature. And maybe if it is a scale of 1 to 10, uh, what number might you give yourself? Uh, The person next to you, what number might they give to you? And whatever number you have in mind, if you think back to 12 months ago, would it be the same or would there be a difference? As we look at these seven things, Uh, You you might like to ask yourself, for each one, how are you going? And if it's helpful for you, um, and if it will help you to listen throughout, maybe give yourself a a score out of five for each one of these. So the first one, what is it to be spiritually mature? Number one, uh, you are growing in your understanding of Jesus. And we see this in chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Uh, 5.11 says... Um, having just spoken all about Jesus as high priest uh, in the order of Melchizedek, uh, the writer says, We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. Or uh, The ESV uh, says you have become dull of hearing. Now that's not really what you want to hear someone say to you, uh, is it? Um, 
those uh, with us today in years uh, six to eight, you get your report card. Um, it's probably not what you want to have written on it, which you're then taking home to your parents. Um, this, this student uh, is, is dull of hearing. Uh, they, they do not want to understand. They are lazy. It's not really what you parents, it's not really what you want to read on a child's report card. Uh, yet it is the accusation uh, here uh, for these uh, Jewish uh, believers. Uh, from, um, from last week, from chapter 4, verse 14, uh, the writer has been helping them and us uh, understand what it means for Jesus to be priest. And not just priest, high priest. Uh, the priest was the one uh, representing the people uh, before God. In chapter 5, uh, verse 1, uh, it says, uh, Selected from among the people and appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. So being human, uh, the priest uh, understood the people, could understand their struggles, their temptations. Uh, the priest was sinful, uh, just like them. And as the priest offered sacrifices for them, uh, he also needed to offer sacrifices for uh, himself. Now here, Jesus is shown to be the perfect high priest. It says that he is in the order of Melchizedek. And it quotes from Psalm 110. Now I'm thinking uh, that uh, most of us here are probably pretty sketchy uh, on Melchizedek. Uh, some of you uh, will know uh, where to find Melchizedek in the Bible. Some of you will know uh, that he is in the book of Genesis. Some of you will know which chapter, that it is Genesis, Genesis chapter 14. Some of you will know that he is both a king and a priest. And some of you will know that Psalm 110 uh, is a uh, messianic psalm. Uh, it's, a, it's a psalm David, the king, is speaking about his king that is going to come in the order of Melchizedek. And so that is saying that the Messiah will be both priest and king. And so this is Jesus. Jesus is shown to be the fulfillment. Jesus uh, offers up uh, prayers and petitions. Uh, but he doesn't uh, just offer a sacrifice, does he? Uh, he is the sacrifice. Uh, fully human, uh, he, he learns obedience, which is interesting, uh, isn't it? And it speaks about him being made perfect. What does that mean? Uh, he, he is not just automatically obedient because of who he is. Uh, he, he learns obedience as, as, as a boy, as a man, as he grows. Uh, he is tempted as we are tempted. Uh, but Jesus, he remains obedient. Uh, he suffers, and in all of this, uh, he is made perfect. Uh, he is shown to be the perfect priest and king, being both obedient uh, and sinless. And so, um, verse 9 and 10 says, He is the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, there's a whole lot going on there, uh, and a whole lot that we haven't uh, spoken about and considered. And I guess that the question is uh, whether you care, or whether I've lost you. Uh, because the writer here is saying that they don't really care, that they're slow to understand. And so maybe a question for us is, like, do you care <laughs> or do you not want to understand um, Jesus and what is being said about him here? Uh, last week, um, we, had, we had 50 of these uh, for people who wanted to understand a little bit more of Jesus, especially leading up to Easter, uh, seeing and savouring uh, Jesus Christ, and uh, to grow in your understanding and your delight of Jesus uh, and now some of you have started reading this yourself or uh, as a family, the wonder uh, of Easter. Uh, so 
if you've started one of these, I think that shows you want to be growing in your understanding of, of Jesus. Um, and of course, there's a whole lot of other ways as well. So maybe ask yourself, how, how are you going? Uh, we're in February, we're, the, the year's already racing away. Uh, how are you going at this, this part of the year? How are you going, growing in your understanding of Jesus? Is this something that you are, are active in at the moment. That's the first one. So I got to speed up. <laughs> what is it to be spiritually mature? Number two, uh, you teach others about Jesus. 5.12 says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not Solid food. Again, this isn't a compliment. So I don't know how the original readers would have been receiving this, but the writer is basically saying they're babies when they should be, like they're adults, but he's saying that they're, they're babies. Still on milk, they should be on food. And it seems that he has the expectation that having grown in your understanding of Jesus, you will then uh, be teaching others about Jesus. An expectation of teaching others. But they're not, are they? He's saying, no, you're immature. You're not growing in your understanding. You're not teaching others. But by now, you should be. But instead, you're still drinking your mother's milk. This, I think, I don't know if they're still listening to him, but um, he's quite, quite harsh on them. Now, teaching can take a whole lot of different forms, can't it? Uh, it can happen in your home. And for the parents here, uh, that is a, a wonderful uh, privilege and responsibility that you have uh, teaching your children all about uh, God and this world and helping them to make sense of it. And uh, as all the questions that they have, uh, you, you are there. And uh, it is primarily you as parents not the kids, church leaders out there, the teachers who do a great job. It's primarily you as, as their parents. Uh, teaching, it can happen just as we speak to one another. We're able to teach each other in conversation as we share the things that we're, we're learning and understanding about Jesus. Uh, it can happen in the classroom. Uh, great to hear uh, from Laura and Joel and, and Josh and uh, there's, there's three uh, from this congregation uh, who are being trained up to enter the, the classroom and teach children about Jesus uh, for the first time this year, uh, which is fantastic, uh, all, all younger people. Uh, might be uh, out there at the moment, there's people teaching the, the kids, um, the youth, the different times of the week. Uh, teaching can take whole lots of different forms. What does it look like for you at the moment? Thirdly, what is it to be spiritually mature? Uh, you can distinguish good from evil. Verse 13, anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So training yourself. Uh, not just relying on the teaching of other people, but being able to, to be a self-learner. And the more that you mature uh, in the word of God and in the ways of God, uh, the more that you will know what is good and what is not. So how are you uh, going with this one? How well are you going distinguishing, knowing what is good and what uh, is evil? Well, fourthly, to be spiritually mature, uh, you are building upon the basic teaching about Jesus. The first few verses of chapter 6 say this, Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death, and a faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. 
Again, don't just stay satisfied with milk. Move on to solid food. Now, as, as a parent, do you want your, your child to be drinking milk all their life? Never to have any meat? Never to have any solid food? Of course not. And this is what he, he's saying to believers, to, to, move, to move on. That doesn't mean to leave the basic teachings behind. And there's some pretty important things listed just here. But it's to, to build upon them. I think what is outlined in these are first three verses. It could be a catechism that they would have, maybe in their baptism class, as these Jews uh, turned to Christ and became Christians. Uh, perhaps this is some of the, the foundations for them. That's a good start, but don't just be content with the basics. Keep, keep learning, keep moving on. Uh, for us, uh, we might say that our uh, Hope Explored course, three weeks, uh, helps people with the, to lay the foundations uh, of who Jesus is and what, what he has done. Uh, but we, we want people to, to be able to move on, to mil- build upon uh, those basics. Uh, and our life groups are a great opportunity to do that with others, digging deeper uh, into God's word. And so we, we encourage everyone of our church uh, to be uh, in a life group. And it's not too late uh, to join. And I know there are some people not in a, in a life group who are, who are very good at pushing themselves and learning themselves through reading uh, and podcasts. So whichever it is for you, just make sure that you are, are growing and maturing. So how are you going with this one? Fifthly, to be spiritually mature, you continue... To love Jesus. So we're going to jump down to 610. And so we're, we're skipping the, the hard bit uh, with the warning. But we're going to come back to it. We will. If there's time. <laughs> um, no, we will. Um, all right. So this speaks there of, of the love that you have shown God. So this is what the Christian life is all about, isn't it? That we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul and strength. And so to be spiritually mature uh, is to, to continue loving Jesus. Having a, a love for him, a love of him uh, that is above all other things. Recognizing that he is, is better than, than anything else. And there's lots of other good things to, to love in this life. Uh, but we are to, to love Jesus above all. All of these, our affections for Christ to keep growing more uh, and more. And you might have affections, growing affections uh, for someone uh, in your life, uh, which is good. Uh, or maybe a, a singer that you like, and maybe this weekend has grown those affections even more. Uh, or it might be a team that you support and your affections grow uh, as you follow that team. But what about our affections for Jesus as we love him, love him, the beauty that is in him, love him and his ways? How are you going growing in the knowledge and love of our Lord Jesus? And linked with this uh, is the the, the sixth one, uh, that you continue to love uh, his people. It's still in, in verse 10. And uh, I've made this an extra point so that we could get to seven because that's just a better number than six. So this is the the second greatest commandment. uh, Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Jesus has said to us, we are to love one another. And so to be spiritually mature is to continue uh, loving uh, one another, loving others uh, as verse 10 says. Uh, And as I look at our church, as I look at you, I see this in action uh, for so many of you, uh, that you do care about uh, other people here, uh, how they're going and how you are able to to help uh, them. Uh, And for many of you, how you have a love uh, for people in the wider community uh, as well. Uh, So that is a sign of your faith in action. Uh, That is a sign of maturity. So, how are you going 
at this one at the moment, uh, actively helping uh, other people of this church and then beyond that, um, or other brothers and sisters in Christ outside of our church, uh, but then thinking about our area as well. Okay, the last one. To be spiritually mature, uh, you are diligent to the very end. Uh, Verses 11 and 12 says, We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end, so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Her diligence, that's a good word, isn't it? Uh, Diligence to the very end. To be spiritually mature is to keep going right to the end. And I would say it's in in this context and everything that we've said uh, so far this morning that we can then now better understand that warning that we have in verses 4 to 6. So they're going to come back up on the screen so you can see uh, this warning. Uh, I'm thinking this is talking to the Christian because it says that they've been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the word of God uh, and the powers of the coming age. And it says they have repented. Um, So uh, it's hard to be brought back to repentance if you haven't already repented. So I would say they have repented. And so I take this as a real warning for uh, believers. Uh, But God will not let us go. God won't let us go. God will keep us to the very end. God will enable us to be diligent to the very end. God enables us to persevere right to the end. And he uses these warnings as one of the ways for us to keep going, keep trusting Jesus. Uh, I've heard it explained uh, this way, which might be helpful for some of you. Uh, If you think of it like a cliff. Now, to to fall off a cliff would be dangerous, right? That might be your end. And so, there are warning signs. There are warning signs there so you don't get too close, so that you know of the danger. Now, I don't think that this, for Christians, it's not like, um, and then this is thinking about life, but um, if there's a cliff there and the danger, that there's an invisible glass wall. And then that just means that we can do whatever we like and that you can run into that glass wall and that you're going to be protected. Um, That's not what God does. What God does, he gives us warnings. And now we've seen three so far in the book of Hebrews. The Christian will listen to God, will listen to Jesus, will listen to the warnings. And so keep trusting and keep persevering and keep Christ as their anchor. Now, I don't think we're, get, we're, we're not meant to get caught up in the whole question of, of falling away, whether you can or can't. That's not the point here. <laughs> What is the point here? The point here is to be a mature Christian, to persevere to the end, um, to progress in your faith, to keep going, to keep Christ as your focus, to keep growing in Christ, to keep loving him, loving others. That that is what uh, the focus is here. And if we reject Christ, then there is no other hope. So keep going in Christ. Now, I take it that, that we all want to be mature. Um, so we're about to finish. And I've just got a few images to, as we finish. Uh, so a tree is going to come up. So would you say this represents your life? So that, that is a mature tree, right? That is a good-looking, healthy tree. It is doing uh, well. Or for you, at the moment, is it this next one? Still doing pretty well, isn't it? Um, Not as good as the first one. And then there's one more. Not doing so well. Much drier land there. And uh, struggling, perhaps, 
to grow. Uh, which of the three would you like to be? Which one are you at the moment? Now, perhaps God's word to you today is a comfort uh, because you know that you, you are trusting Jesus and you can see the progress that you've made, maybe in the last 12 months. And so keep, keep going, keep trusting Jesus. Uh, and I, I can especially see this for some of our younger people at church at the moment. I, I can see in them uh, just how much they have grown in the last 12 months, uh, which is really encouraging for me because uh, I don't necessarily see the same growth in me that I'm seeing uh, in some of you. Perhaps what we're looking at this morning is a challenge for you because you know you're not growing or you're not that first tree. You know that perhaps you have become a little bit lazy, maybe just content with where you're at or what you know about Jesus. Uh, and maybe that can be true that the older that we get, and you get as old as me, maybe we get to the point where, where we do stop growing and we get content uh, in what we already know. But that is dangerous from what we are seeing here. So if this is a challenge to you in any way, can I encourage you um, not just to walk out the doors today without thinking about what it is that you might need to do to keep growing in Christ. Last week we saw how important it is that we keep urging one another uh, to keep going, that none of us fall short. Keep encouraging each other to keep having Christ as our anchor. So may we do this. And as we, as we finish up, before we, we're about to sing our next song, maybe just think of one thing that God might be saying to you this morning from this part of his word and what it is you want to do in response. Um, so the band's going to come up, but as they do, just give thought to one thing that would be good for you to do in response.